Open diffs suck. Wouldn't it be nice if we could make a locker for this thing? On today's episode, we're gonna try just that. So before we explain the locker, I wanna explain how the open diff works and why we don't like it. So this is the inside of the open differential. Ring gear would bolt here, and it rotates the entire carrier with drive shaft input. The little gears in here are what differentiate the torque between the left and the right sides. So as you go around a corner, the inside wheel has to go a different speed than the outside wheel. The issue with that is there's nothing to, you know, kind of control the amount of slip between those two sides. So if one wheel has no traction whatsoever and the other does, all of that power is gonna be put through these gears and put to the wheel with no traction. So here's the carrier, ring gear bolts here, and that's what rotates the whole carrier as the drive shaft spins. These gears are what are splitting the torque between the two sides. So if there's nothing on one side, it'll just unload to the other side. Well, it'll do that. So you can see the one gear on the left here is going twice as fast because I'm holding this stopped. So what I've designed for this is what they call a lunchbox locker, which is a drop-in locker to replace the spider gears in the center of the carrier here. And how that works is kind of like a ratchet. So if you think of this as the carrier and the ring gear spins, you know, the ratchet handles like this, the outputs would be these two sockets. So in this case, when you go around a corner, the outside wheel can freewheel faster and overspeed to make it around the corner, but one wheel can never go slower than the other because of the ratchet mechanism. So you're allowing an overspeed, but never an underspeed. And that's how you're getting it to lock for off-road purposes. All right, so to make sure I had all the right clearances and to kind of test the theory of my locking mechanism, I 3D printed what I had designed. So these are the 3D prints here. And I've got an outer gear here. This is what drives the stub shaft. The uh, center pin that would normally hold the spider gears is what drives this piece here. And that's where you're getting your ratcheting mechanism. And then there's one for each side. A couple drive pins and it, I'm definitely oversimplifying. This took quite a bit of thought, but we have the actual production piece here, and we're gonna try to throw it in. All right, so here's the gist of how this locker operates. This upper plate here is controlled by the center pivot pin. So when it's in the center, it can, you know, freewheel the outside. But once it locks in, and then this can rotate, it'll rotate up against that pin, and then it can't lift off anymore. So then it's locked. So it will be able to ratchet to the freewheel position or the lock position. You have to disassemble the carrier and everything to get the pin out. You can't have the ring gear on and slide the center pin out of the carrier. So that's why all this is removed. Um, I'm saving one shim from the factory spider gear setup, and that's gonna go on this output gear. There were two Belleville washers. We're not using those. So we're gonna drop the lower gear in. And then we're gonna do the same with the upper gear. And this is where it's a little cumbersome. You're gonna have to hang on to some stuff. Then these lock into those side gears. So there's a groove in them that fits well. You gotta put these into the center piece, slip it in, get one side to lock. That'll give you enough space to get the other side in, like so. With that locked, you can see, get that lined up, we can rotate it and then slip the center pin through, which is gonna take a little fiddling with those two rings that were in there. Before you put the pin in, how about that? You move those center collars up so you can hold it with your finger from the other side. A little fiddly. There we go. Now, center pins in, lockers in. Now we just have to pull these little pins, which will release those springs, put everything in its place. Now, we have a locker. So, 
this one side locked. The other can't go too far because of those pins. So this should be allowed to slide up and ratchet. So after some reevaluation, if you take some snap ring pliers and open up this clip, you can then get this pin in and started. There we go. So now that's in, that's good. Now we just have to reassemble the entire diff. So if you're not changing bearings, you need to mark which side came from which and make sure you put them back in the same spot. Also on these diffs, the uh, snap rings are your shims. So they're in different thicknesses, says it on them. So that really matters which way you put them. But I'm gonna slip in this outer race here. And slip in this guy. Then I gotta wrestle with some snap rings. And somebody painted this. Me and masked it shitty. Okay, now we'll put in the big death snap ring. These things are ridiculous. So if you have a giant pair of snap ring pliers, uh, use them on this. I don't, so I'm gonna go with some needle nose because they actually fit and they have enough teeth where I'm not gonna shoot this clean across the room. Um, this is a big thick snap ring and it's kind of intense. So two-hander for sure. Okay, I got that guy, flip this on its side, into the bearing, bearing number two, oh, there's a groove on it from where it went. Just like that. We just need bigger snap ring pliers and we don't have any. Oh, there we go. Just a little bit of sauce. Just a little. Beep. So to get these access to those snap rings and everything, you have to destroy the old seals, but it's a good time to put new seals in anyway. I'm not doing the pinion seal because I don't feel like messing with that, but now we should be able to just throw in these. That's good, that works. I'm gonna install one of our magnetic drain plugs because we're testing this and it's a fair, a fair amount of assumptions I had to make making a locker. So I'd like to see how many chunks come out or if any chunks come out. Good practice with any diff though. So I will install that. Then we can put the cover on and seal that on and fill it up with fluid. Another one. Another one. Another one. Another one. All right, so I pretty much unbolted on the stock diff. Um, just, you know, CVs. The CV to the drive shaft, and then there's one big mount up here, and then two little guys up front. Nothing crazy. I didn't feel like pulling the exhaust to pull the heat shield, so I just kind of tweaked them out of the way. My heat shields were pretty mangled to begin with, so I'm really not too worried about it. It's gonna save me some time. So, I'm just gonna get the last uh, bit of bolts out. We'll drop this thing out. rusted together. And that was a brass hammer. I didn't ruin anything. Stupid thing out of here. Incredibly useful, but very in the way. Okay. All right, so our first test was not a success. Uh, I noticed right away that like I couldn't get it to ratchet by hand. I assumed, you know, with tires on it, a little more load would be able to get these ramp angles to kick apart and ratchet correctly. That was wrong. I, you know, moved the car, backed it out of the, into the shop. Shop floor is pretty slippery too. I was like, eh. 
Not a great test, went out in the parking lot and it still didn't unlock. Well, we have a problem. So I brought it back in. It had broken all of the pins because I took a guess at to, as to the ramp angle on all these little teeth. And that's what, you know, the force of that is what's supposed to kick it apart so that it can ratchet. And it was too close to vertical, so it never kicked apart, which overloaded those pins and broke them all. So what I'm doing now is I pulled it back apart, obviously, and I'm remachining the angle on all these teeth. So I've got it fixed up in the middle. You can show you that in a minute. And I'm trying to add some angle to all those. So now both of these have been machined and they kick apart much nicer. Before, this one hasn't been machined, but this has, so it's not a great test, but this grabs quite a bit harder and it's harder to kick it apart. So that was our issue. Um, I'm experimenting with these angles, kind of playing with it by machining a couple pieces. Then I'm gonna throw it together, test it by hand, because it should work by hand, and uh, then we'll settle on what to do for production. So I've got it fixed up in the mill. I have this rotary head here, and uh, I've set the, the head of the mill to the angle I'm trying to change it to. And then I just keep indexing it around for the 14 different teeth. Did some cheat sheet math there so I know which position to be in each time. And I'm just kind of zipping across each tooth and changing the angle slightly. So I remachined all the teeth. I tried five degrees, then I ended up settling on 10 degrees more on each tooth. So I manually machined all of those, which kind of sucked but now we have a functional locker. So if I rock the carrier over, it's like it would be driving this wheel. And this is the wheel that you would want to freewheel in that case. So now it will ratchet in that direction, but when that wheel needs to be driven as well, it locks and then engages the carrier. Same with the other direction, ratchets and then locks. So. We now have a functional locker that I can replicate on the bench. So now we'll throw it all back together again and road test it. But pretty comfortable now that it'll actually unlock. So I was putting some street miles on the locker and uh, we had a failure. So I made it a couple days. Um, you can see this side gear has become many pieces. Um, I've concluded my hardness spec is way too hard for this thing. And on top of that, this is a worst case scenario because you saw me machine all these teeth. I added a stress riser at each individual tooth. And you can see it broke right at the edge of each of the teeth here. So I think that was the cause. Now it broke at a couple of those teeth and then once it, you know, wasn't a complete spline, it just fractured around the rest of the splines and kind of stemmed out from the center. So not super surprising, especially after reevaluating what I spec for hardness. I kind of just based it off of, you know, a running fit with the gear, but these are shock loaded a lot more than I had put that much thought into. <laughs> so obviously that didn't work out. Uh, so I'm gonna revise a couple things. We're gonna get a second prototype and try that one. All right, so the revised locker is here. I'm gonna go over the changes I made to hopefully make this work a little bit better. Uh, last time you saw I machined all the ramp angles on the original one and altered them. It worked nice. So now that is the revised ramp angle on all these. Um, the thing that obviously broke was my hardness spec was way too high. So the thing shattered. Um, I've dialed that back a bit to something a lot more reasonable. And I've added a bunch of fillets in all these teeth to try to reduce some stress risers. I don't think it would have been that bad other than me machining it. I think I created all the stress risers but regardless, it was way too hard to begin with. Uh, on top of that, I upped the pin size a little bit, so they're a little bit bigger. The pins are now available separately if you were to ever have an issue with them. And now there's access to those pins so you can lock them back in place to disassemble it again. So everything should fit together nice. Um, just throw it back in, we'll get back to testing.
Works good. So this is all back together. Ratchets correctly. So now I just have to throw it back in the diff, put some oil in it, and then we can throw it in the X5. All right, we're gonna try to explain the locker, which is now installed um, on the car, because it's kind of tricky to explain, you know, on the bench. So, car's in park, so you have to think of this as a little bit backwards here. But if I were to try to turn this wheel backwards, which is as if the car were driving forwards, one wheel can overspeed and ratchet faster, but no wheel can go slower than the other. So it starts to, this is locked where they're both loaded. And now this one can overspeed. So that's the premise. That's how a ratcheting locker works. Um, it does work in both directions. Same thing for reverse. So just got to go out and put some street miles on it and go test it. All right, so as you can see, it ratchets this way, so we backed onto this. But if it were under load to back up further, locks right up. So we have a successful ratcheting locker. Grip unparalleled. Doesn't give a shit. So as you can see, the locker added quite a bit of grip to this thing. Stuff that we used to struggle on is much easier now, and it opened up a whole bunch of opportunities for some harder lines through a bunch of different obstacles. So everything works well. Um, street manners are good because it's a ratcheting locker. Um, and that pretty much does it for this episode. This is something I'm super pumped on. Has I've put a ton of work behind trying to get this to work correctly, and it's been a departure from one of our normal product lines. So this has been a huge learning experience, and I'm really excited with how it turned out. I hope you guys are too. Uh, make sure you like and subscribe, and you can follow along uh, with everything else we do.